very exciting afternoon, I think, and hopefully um, a discussion or a presentation today that will lead to a lot of discussion. So uh, um, welcome to everybody who's, 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 who's come today. And I just want to remind you about this, the background to this meeting. This is the Gastro Echo meeting hosted by the Gastro Foundation. Thank you, Chris Cassianides, Prof. Chris, um, uh, in association with Project Echo uh, at the University of New Mexico. And these sessions are held every Wednesday. The sessions vary greatly, and this uh, basically concerns everything regarding gastroenterology, hepatology, hepatocellular carcinoma, procedures, etc. And every month or two, we also have an opportunity to discuss patient blood management and any related issues, uh, for which we're very grateful. Uh, special thanks to Cheryl Valentine and Karen Fenton, who does a lot of the behind-the-scenes work to get these meetings up and running, and also to the Echo Indian India team, who works on the technical side of things from there. So with that, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. David Richardson. Now, um, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background. So David uh, matriculated at Westerford High School. For those of you who may have been to the same place, and passed his MBCHB at UCT uh, with honors and distinction, both his clinical and final examinations. And to top that off, uh, did his uh, hematopathology specialization also at UCT. And his MED was also with distinction, passed with distinction earlier this year. And the topic of today is actually going to be this topic on which he did his MED research. He's currently busy with his uh, PhD in lymphoma diagnostics at UCT in our division. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to have uh, David work with us. Um, and you would think this man is very, he's too busy for anything else, but he's, uh, in addition to all this, the father of four children. And he's also a musician. He plays uh, guitar and bass in his local church. And um, David, I think you're going to, to put the fox in the hen pen, or what do they say? How do they call that thing in English? Chris, come help us with your Greek English. Um, the, <laughs> chicken, the chicken pen or something. <laughs> because one of the great difficulties in iron deficiency is to diagnose the patient with iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia when they have inflammation or cancer and it's 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 one of the conditions in the literature and people always say no you need the gold standard to determine these things and what is the gold standard bone marrow but patients don't want to go and lie down to have bone marrows done so that you can ascertain the correct uh value you know the correct cut off or reference ranges for diagnosing iron deficiency in particular in these settings so David went out and he did exactly this, studied the bone marrows of patients with inflammation. And I'm not going to give anything more away. Without further ado, David, share, please share your screen. And the floor is... All right. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you for having me on this platform. It's a pleasure to be able to speak with you all today. Uh, I was wondering there, Prof, if you were going to to get carried away and share share all our results, um, <laughs> but it is an exciting topic. I know it it always gets your blood pumping. So yes, without much further ado, then. The topic from today is from the marrow to the blood, optimizing the diagnosis of iron deficiency in the setting of inflammation. To warm us up to this topic a little bit, I will start with a case. The patient is Mr. TC, a 35 year old male who's known to have HIV and is currently on treatment with an undetectable viral load and a CD4 count of 181. He presents with fatigue, loss of weight, and abdominal pain, and an examination is found to have pallor, wasting, and marked hepatosplenomegaly. B 
being a hematopathologist, I cannot resist skimming over uh, examinations and jumping to the full blood count. And you can see that the white cell count is reduced, as is the hemoglobin. But of interest, the mean cellular volume and sorry, the mean cellular volume and the mean uh, corpuscular hemoglobin are on the lower side of normal, but within the reference range. Platelets are clumped, uh, so we're not able to give an accurate count, but it's possible that this patient has a pancytopenia. Having attended some of these sessions, the good doctor who was seeing the patient remembered uh, Prof Lowe's wise words that the indication for iron studies is the presence of a pulse. And so a full iron study was requested and it showed uh, low serum iron, but normal transferrin, reduced transferrin saturation and a normal ferritin. So the question then is, as has been alluded to, what exactly does this mean? And the patient who clearly has some other uh, illnesses going on, how do we interpret these iron studies in the picture of inflammation? The possible causes for the anemia could be the HIV itself, uh, anemia of chronic diseases uh, related to the antiretrovirals or due to the primary pathology, which at this point was yet to be determined. So with this case in mind, we carry on. To give you a little bit of a background on iron deficiency anemia, simply put, it's a reduction in either the hemoglobin, hematocrit, or red cell count below the age and sex adjusted reference interval. And this anemia comes about due to inadequate iron. To understand the reason for the pictures in the top corner, we have uh, Mr. Patrice Motsepe, who has a wonderful 2 billion US dollars in his bank account and WhatsApp with 2 billion users worldwide. And anemia is part of that club with an estimated 2 billion people in the globe suffering from anemia. Half of these cases are thought to be due to iron deficiency. And furthermore, another billion people have iron deficiency without anemia. So a total of 2 billion people globally suffering from the symptoms of iron deficiency. In South Africa, the numbers have varied between different studies, depending on uh, the geography, the social circumstances, the age, ethnicity, and so on. But estimates of the prevalence of iron deficiency range from about 20 to 50%, with about 10% of our population having iron deficiency anemia. The significance of this is obviously vast. First of all, symptoms of iron deficiency, although seemingly innocuous, such as fatigue, uh, headaches, but we know that these symptoms, if lived with day to day, can significantly impact quality of life. But more than the ability to reduce these symptoms if treated properly, understanding and proving iron deficiency is naturally important so that we can look to establish what the cause of the iron deficiency was to identify it and correct it. Then, given the importance and the prevalence of iron deficiency, how do we detect it? The bone marrow biopsy is the ideal test to conclusively prove the presence of iron deficiency by looking right at the source where the red, red cells are main, made and seeing whether or not there's iron available. But this is an invasive and painful procedure and it's fairly labor intensive. So naturally we don't use the gold standard for most patients and rather we opt for the happy scene on the bottom right with the peripheral blood test. We can get an idea whether or not there's iron deficiency present by looking either at red cell parameters or biochemical markers of iron status, which I'll speak about a little bit later. What then is the problem with this seemingly happy scene on the right? The problem is that if you have a patient who has no iron and there's a background of inflammation, your tests become unreliable and you're presented with a diagnostic challenge. 
Firstly, our red cell indices. We all are familiar with the microcytic hyperchromic picture that is expected in iron deficiency. And you can see these red cells in varying shapes and sizes, also a feature of iron deficiency. When compared to this lymphocyte, appear small, and they have large areas of central pallor in keeping with late iron deficiency. And that late word is important because red cell indices like the MCV and MCH drop gradually. And early on in iron deficiency, well, I must add there are still consequences and there is still a cause, the MCV and MCH can in fact be normal. But secondly, these are influenced by other factors uh, in our population or in our patient specifically, HIV plays an important role as do the drugs which can both increase the MCV. This patient uh, who was presented earlier also had an enlarged liver and liver disease can contribute or common pastimes such as alcohol. To improve this situation, we can, instead of looking at the long-lived red cells that circulate for 120 days, which might obscure the picture of a newer onset of iron deficiency, we can look rather at the reticulocytes. The reticulocytes only circulate in the blood for about three days, and this means they give us a fairly up-to-date status on what is going on in the bone marrow and how much iron is available. So if we look at the reticulocyte hemoglobin content, we can, in theory, evaluate early iron deficiency and evaluate the response to therapy. There is, however, a poor consensus on which cutoff values should be used and how much uh, sway these values should hold. What then about our iron studies? The problem with these is that both transferrin and ferritin are acute phase respondents. Transferrin increases uh, in iron deficiency as it is our carrier molecule. When there's not enough iron around, the carrier increases to ensure that whatever iron is available can be readily mobilized to where it is needed most. Ferritin decreases in iron deficiency and a level of less than 15 or less than 30 would be considered as diagnostic of iron deficiency. Using a cutoff of 15, however, has a fairly poor sensitivity estimated to be about 60%, but the specificity is excellent, uh, approaching 100%. In contrast, using the slightly higher cutoff of 30 micrograms per liter has a vastly improved sensitivity of around 92%, but poorer specificity estimated at about 90%. Of interest, though, in HIV, the serum ferritin doesn't correlate as well with iron stores, uh, as shown in some studies, but rather correlates with a decreased CD4 count and an increased CRP. And a standardized cutoff for serum ferritin hasn't been found or proven yet, at least in HIV. So that is our picture in iron deficiency. In inflammation, however, transferrin, being a negative acute phase reactant, drops, and ferritin, being a positive acute phase reactant, increases. In anemia of chronic diseases, therefore, we'd expect to find reduced transferrin and increased ferritin. The problem is this middle category here. What do you do with a patient who has both iron deficiency and inflammation? As you can see, it's fairly easy to differentiate anemia of chronic diseases from iron deficiency, but to differentiate anemia of chronic diseases from anemia of chronic diseases plus inflammation is far less clear. One of the proposed approaches is the use of the soluble transferrin receptor, and you'll see many of the studies that are done use this marker, but its availability is still fairly limited, and there's poor standardization of the assays and reference ranges, including a lack of reference ranges in patients with HIV, which makes this a, a less useful marker in clinical practice. I have already alluded to this, but this is a helpful overview just to understand that 
not only are there the difficulties in terms of having background inflammation, but also at what stage of iron deficiency a patient is. So you can see serum ferritins may be within the normal range in the transfer and also may be in the normal range or only mildly reduced in early iron deficiency, which can further complicate the diagnosis. Coming back to our available markers, I think at this point it's useful to bring up an example from the local literature. So a study done by one of our colleagues, Mechlatse Mankele, investigating under diagnosis of iron deficiency in HIV-infected individuals, looked at the soluble transfer and receptor to try and work out what useful cutoffs could be used to diagnose iron deficiency again correlating to the gold standard. Of interest to me was the fact that they did ferritin, but didn't investigate it very thoroughly, and as it wasn't the focus of their study. But they did include it in one of their tables. And you can see here that this standard diagnostic cutoff of 30 identified only one of 13 iron deficient patients in their study. So you can see that the standard marker for this relatively small group definitely was not adequate to the task. How then do we improve the situation? There have been various proposed uh, methodologies for how to improve the diagnosis of iron deficiency in this setting. The one approach is to use non-standard parameters such as the soluble transferrin receptor or reticulocyte indices like the reticulocyte hemoglobin content that I've already mentioned. Alternatively, you could use a combination of parameters, as you'll see shortly, or by using a higher serum ferritin cutoff for a patient with a raised CRP or in specific diseases. So for instance, in cardiac failure, some guidelines recommend using a serum ferritin cutoff of 300 for the diagnosis of iron deficiency. Or others say if you have either a ferritin less than 100 or a transferrin saturation less than 20. In inflammatory bowel disease, a cutoff of 300 has also been proposed. And in renal disease, some guidelines go as far as saying any ferritin less than 500 could be considered iron deficient. The British Journal of Hematology have this proposed guideline. In the absence of inflammation, we follow the standard practice of saying a ferritin less than 15 is iron deficiency, more than 15 iron deficiency is unlikely. In those with inflammation, we still say less than 15 is iron deficiency, but now increase this to 150 to say that iron deficiency is unlikely. In the gray zone, they recommend then for patients with inflammation and a theoretically normal ferritin of 15 to 150, that if the blood morphology features are suggestive of iron deficiency or the mean reticulocyte hemoglobin content is suggestive of iron deficiency or additional studies such as the transfer and saturation are low, then we would have supportive evidence of iron deficiency and we can then diagnose iron deficiency. The WHO have a different approach in which they say that for adolescents and adults, again, a ferritin less than 15 in healthy individuals is iron deficient, and a ferritin of less than 70 in those with inflammation would be considered iron deficient. This guideline goes on to say, though, that they do recommend that in areas of widespread inflammation, ferritin should be assessed with a CRP and an alpha-1 acid glycoprotein to prove the presence of inflammation, and that in these patients, that cutoff of 70 should be used. Another recommendation from them has good value, but it has unfortunately skewed quite a lot of the literature. So they recommend using a value of 30 to 30 for apparently uh, inflamed children and a cutoff of 70 for adults and adolescents. 
that many of the studies follow the second line here where they say the other method is to exclude individuals with elevated concentrations of CRP. This means that a lot of the studies estimating the incidence of iron deficiency or working around novel parameters such as the soluble transferrin receptor simply exclude all patients with inflammation from the study, which means that the findings of these studies are very likely not that applicable uh, to those of us who work primarily with unwell hospital patients. The WHO document goes on to identify uh, some key features uh, of future research uh, that should be present. And of note to us particularly was that there's a desire to have studies that compare ferritin and other iron status indicators with bone marrow iron content in the presence of biomarkers of inflammation. And this is exactly where we hoped to fit our study in. Of note, this is from the British Journal of Hematology, which I showed you the guideline for earlier, which use CRP. And even they acknowledge that interpreting ferritin in the context of raised inflammatory markers such as CRP, despite being proposed, doesn't actually have a robust evidence base. So, what can we do to improve the situation and what was the goal of our research? Essentially, our hypothesis that was that if we interpret the iron studies in combination with an indicator of inflammation uh, available for us being the CRP, we would have a more accurate assessment of iron stores. And we aimed to determine the relationship between the peripheral blood studies and the bone marrow iron stores in the setting of chronic inflammation. We were unable to meet our first objective conclusively of determining the prevalence of absolute and functional iron deficiency, uh, as you'll see later. And then the second objectives were to determine if CRP as an inflammatory marker could be used in conjunction with iron studies to diagnose iron deficiency and to determine if alternative surrogate markers exist to predict iron deficiency in patients. Uh, with hematological malignancy, inflammation, and people living with HIV. Our study was cross-sectional. Being a hematology department, we have the, the fortunate position of having people who are referred for bone marrow biopsies for other reasons, which means we didn't need to convince people to let us stick needles into them who otherwise wouldn't have needed it. So any patient who was coming into our clinic for a bone marrow biopsy provided they hadn't yet been started on chemotherapy, hadn't received iron therapy, or a recent blood transfusion was considered for enrollment. If they didn't have complete iron studies, or if their bone marrow was of an inadequate quality for us to accurately assess for iron, the patients were excluded. Initially, we welcomed everyone through the door, and we had 116 patients, of whom 97 had adequate or increased iron stores, and 19 had depleted iron stores. Because we wanted to ensure our analysis was adequately powered, we increased our iron deficient patients by doing a second review to identify a further 23 patients, only including those with iron deficiency. For those of you not familiar with the laboratory side of things, this is what I then was looking at under the microscope. So we do a Pearl's Prussian blue stain, and I hope it's re reflecting adequately on your side, but on the top left, we have a sideroblast, which is a nucleated erythrocyte, and you can, with the eye of faith, see a small blue dot in it, and that blue dot is iron, and it shows that this patient is successfully mobilizing their iron stores into the red blood cells for erythropoiesis. In panels B and C, we see patients with iron deficiency, either graded as zero, a complete absence of iron, or grade one, a marked reduction in the iron content, with only small particles of iron in blue visible under high power with oil. From then on, we see patients who have adequate or increased iron. 
uh, with numerous of these uh, blue particles seen. So for our study, everyone with either grade naught or grade one, so either absent or markedly reduced iron was considered to be deficient. Furthermore, we assessed our patients' markers of iron status, so that's their serum iron transferrin, serum ferritin, and additionally, we assessed their C-reactive protein levels and red cell indices and reticulocyte studies. Of note, we must just mention quickly the transferrin saturation you can see is not mentioned here because that parameter is calculated using serum iron and transferrin. Supportive details such as comorbidities, blood transfusions, and medication were all obtained from clinical files in our REDCap database, and additional lab results such as their CD4s and viral loads for the HIV positive patients and histological diagnosis were relevant, were also extracted. With this background of the study covered, I will now move on to the results from our study. 139 patients were eventually included in our study. We had a very high prevalence of anemia with 71% of the iron deficiency group having low hemoglobins. As expected, this population had reduced MCV, MCH, and reticulocyte hemoglobin compared to the iron replete group, and that is in keeping with erythropoiesis uh, that is iron restricted, so insufficient iron available for the production of the red cell hemoglobin. There also was a very high prevalence of inflammation, with 72% of our patients who had CRPs having a CRP greater than 5. In terms of the iron studies, we start now getting to the meat of the results. The standard cutoff of a serum ferritin of less than 30 picked up 15 of our iron deficient patients. So that is only 36%. While there were no false positives in this group, that still is a fairly poor sensitivity, although obviously perfect specificity is uh, wonderful to see. Carrying up into this group of 30 the serum ferritins of 30 to 300, we can see the majority of our patients fall into this category, but a few patients, 7% uh, or 3, had ferritin levels above 300. So while I wouldn't recommend starting all your patients with ferritins above 300 on iron, it is still definitely worth noting that even at these high levels, iron deficiency cannot actually be reliably excluded and a pragmatic approach would be simply to continue to monitor these patients and perhaps as their primary conditions are treated, the iron deficiency will be unmasked and provided you're looking for it, you can then still uh, treat and investigate it further fairly promptly. In terms of the transfer and saturation, we can see that it performed fairly well so transferrin saturation of less than 20, which is commonly recommended, picked up 81% of our iron deficiency patients. The issue here is while it does have improved sensitivity compared to serum ferritin, the specificity is far poorer with 45% of iron replete patients, remember this even includes patients with iron overload, would have been called iron deficient if we used a TSAT of less than 20 as our sole diagnostic criteria. Looking at serum ferritin and transferrin saturation combined, we can see that these do perform fairly well. So it's, but the issue with it is again, still we lack good specificity and we're seeing patients with both replete and deficient stores included in these groups. From here, our next step was to run univariable analysis to identify all of the variables that were predictive of iron deficiency, and then multivariable analysis to assess for confounding. Any uh, predictive uh, variable then 
was included in our next analysis, which was receiver operator curve characteristic analysis. And in this, we started to introduce the idea of subdividing our patients into those with inflammation and those without as defined by a CRP less than or equal to five or greater than five. In the total group, the optimal cutoff identified was 80. At this cutoff, similar to that recommended by the WHO in the setting of inflammation, we saw fairly excellent specificity of 94%, but relatively poor specificity, a sensitivity at 69%. In contrast, when we divided our groups into those with and without inflammation, we saw a very good division with those without inflammation still using this optimal cutoff of 80. Now, improved outstanding specificity and excellent sensitivity at 93%. The cutoff jumped all the way up to 200 micrograms per liter for those with inflammation and maintained reasonable specificity and improved sensitivity. Transfer and saturation didn't have as wide a variation in terms of optimal cutoffs, but you can appreciate that it, in those without inflammation, it had excellent specificity and sensitivity. Of interest though, even in the group with elevated uh, CRP, at a slightly lower cutoff, uh, this could be rounded to a transfer and saturation of less than 13%, we see decent specificity and a good odds ratio of 5.7 in predicting iron deficiency. We did analysis to assess for various combinations of markers, and we found that in those with a CRP greater than five, combining transfer and saturation and ferritin cutoffs managed to maintain the sensitivity that we saw with ferritin alone, but significantly improved the specificity. To look in a little bit more detail at uh, that rock curve analysis, we can see here on the left, with the multiple biomarkers assessed in a setting of inflammation, the blue line, serum ferritin, is by far the best performing marker. And this is a significant finding all by itself because many people are under the impression that because ferritin is an acute phase reactant, it cannot be reliably used in the setting of inflammation. Whereas, although perhaps our exact cutoffs may not be applicable to all patient populations, I think it is helpful nevertheless to understand that ferritin itself maintains its utility as an excellent marker of iron deficiency, even in the presence of inflammation. All that we need to do is understand at what cutoffs we should be diagnosing iron deficiency. The other fairly well-performing marker is the transfer and saturation, which you can see performing comparably to the, MC, uh, to the MCV in those with inflammation, but having a, an improved outcome in those without inflammation. Reticulocyte hemoglobin was an interesting marker because if you remember from that British Journal of Hematology guideline, they recommend that in those with inflammation and suspected iron deficiency, reticulocyte hemoglobin should be used as a tiebreaker to see whether or not we classify this patient as having inflammation or not. But our results didn't support this. And we showed that reticulocyte hemoglobin actually performed significantly better in those without inflammation compared to those with inflammation. And in fact, reticulocyte hemoglobin was our worst performing marker in this analysis. Based on these findings, our proposed algorithm for the diagnosis of iron deficiency in hospital patients and those who are otherwise unwell would be as follows. Similarly to the British Journal of Hematology, we divide our group into those with clear-cut iron deficiency, but using a significantly increased cutoff of 80. 
The benefit of this is it would limit you to a single test where you say a ferritin less than 80 in an unwell patient would be suggestive of iron deficiency with no further tests required. A ferritin above 200 in this population, one could say that iron deficiency is unlikely. Our gray zone then is here between ferritins of 80 and 200. For these patients, our study suggests that using an CRP is a useful marker to stratify the patients into two groups. Those in this gray zone who do not have an elevated CRP, we can conclude that iron deficiency is unlikely. But for those with an elevated CRP, further testing is necessary. If we say that these patients also have a low transferrin saturation, this would be suggestive of iron deficiency. But if the transferrin saturation is elevated, that would suggest anemia of inflammation only and no concurrent iron deficiency. It is important to note though that obviously we have to say iron deficiency is unlikely because six of our patients in this group actually did go on to have iron deficiency. So again, uh, some clinical acumen and watchful waiting as the patient's primary disease is treated is probably what's called for in these situations. And as a reminder, this algorithm then was shown to have about 78% sensitivity with 92% specificity. The strength of our study ultimately rested in the fact that we used bone marrow iron stores as the diagnostic gold standard with CRP as an inflammatory marker. The limitation, the high prevalence of malignancies and HIV in our setting may limit the applicability of the study to other settings, but we believe it does have wide relevance to other in-hospital populations. The high prevalence of lymphoma and myeloma may have introduced bias, um, as this obviously is not representative, and retrospective case finding weakened our study methodology. For this reason, we think future studies, including large prospective studies which have bone marrow iron stores and perhaps multiple inflammatory biomarkers, should be performed to validate this approach and our proposed cutoffs. Another thing which would be very interesting to assess is the therapeutic response in patients with absolute iron deficiency and raised serum ferritin. It is, of course, possible that the background inflammation may mean that their response to iron may be blunted, and uh, understanding the applicability of our findings in clinical practice would be important. Furthermore, future studies in other populations with lower burdens of HIV and malignancy would be helpful. This study essentially highlights the critical role of serum ferritin in iron diagnosis, and is a reminder that even in the presence of, ferrit uh, of significant inflammation, ferritin still is an excellent biomarker, but different cutoffs should be considered. The cutoffs we recommend are higher than most common guidelines, recommending that even in the absence of an elevated CRP, these patients with a serum ferritin less than 80 could reliably be diagnosed with iron deficiency. And in those with an elevated CRP, a ferritin as high as 200 combined with a reduced transferrin saturation would give us a high sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of iron deficiency. This is an important finding because it means that many patients are underdiagnosed for iron deficiency in the hospital setting. And this is pertinent because we know the significance clinically of iron deficiency and we have such a wide variety of effective iron therapy available to us. So to come back to our case, if I now divulge a CRP of 10, we can see that this patient comfortably fitted within our recommended ranges and indeed was shown to have absent iron stores despite having a ferritin of 158. With that, I will close and thank you again for your attention, as well as thanking uh, Prof. Lowe and Prof. Opie, who were my supervisors for this project, as well as Estelle Fuberg, Jody Rush, and Karen Brown, my co-authors. Okay, thank you very much for your time, and I'll hand over to you if there are any questions. Fantastic, David. And the picture David's got on the screen 
um, is of this work being presented at the ISLH, which is the International uh, Conference for Laboratory Hematology um, in France recently. Uh, congratulations again, David, on having that accepted there as well. So very exciting to have something that is local, that is re uh, relevant to the type of population um, at least seen in the hematology environment, but also uh, broader hospitalized patients, HIV patients. Chris, I wonder if I can ask you just to maybe give your first impressions of what you've heard. And uh, although it looks like Chris has been frozen, so maybe I must not ask Chris for his opinion. Um, Chris, if you could hear me. Yeah, um... and, uh, can you hear me, Chris? Fantastic. Yeah. Are you asking me? Yes. Your first impressions, if you listen to, to the story. Okay. Yes, I, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, no, excellent. Oh, excellent, David. I mean, yeah, no, ex excellent. I mean, really a source of great, great discomfort whenever you have to interpret these in a setting of information. There's just two important settings. The one you mentioned, inflammatory bowel disease. There, the CRP is invariably elevated. Um, although there's no correlation between the degree or activity of the inflammatory bowel uh, disease and the height of the CRP, but invariably it is elevated. So I think this algorithm, which you've given, throwing in a bit of transferrin saturation, in addition to the cutoff sulfuritin, I think will help us enormously. I think that's enormously helpful. I've been using um, uh, soluble transferrin receptor, but it's it's not help me very much. I have access to it. And as you say, it's not universally available. The other important setting, and I think one that you're going to need to embrace because it's coming up as a big, big subspecialty is fatty liver disease, the metabolic dysfunction, so, uh, 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 liver disease, which because of the treatment that are now available, Ferritin as acute phase reactant in fatty liver is invariably high. There the CRP, although there is a inflammatory milieu uh, associated with metabolic syndrome and all the comorbidities, CRP might not be the, the, the biomarker to help us differentiate, um, you know, the, the, the two, the two um, uh, issues of whether there is in fact iron deficiency or not. Um, so I think that will be an important uh, setting, particularly in an outpatient, an outpatient setting where patients walk into your office, they are well, the uh, um, liver associated transaminases may or may not be elevated, but imaging shows a fatty liver. 90% of the patients who walk into my office uh, for all symptomatology invariably invariably will be a, uh, will have a fatty liver and when i do iron studies invariably the ferritin is over 100 so it in that setting the crp might not help us but in the more commonal hospital setting with an ill patient uh, i think your algorithm is has is it, it will help me even further delineate those patients with iron deficiency in inflammatory bowel disease. So thank you very much. I found it very useful. Thanks so much, Chris, for those comments. And I really want to welcome anybody. Um, and thanks, everybody, for staying until now. For, for uh, I'd like to, to, to ask for any comments. I see Andrea Kutsia, um has a hand up. Andrea also <laughs> works in our unit and is also um, embarking on a master's degree dealing with iron deficiency. Andrea, go ahead. Uh, firstly, um, David, that was a very, very insightful presentation, very well done and very interesting findings. Uh, my qu question ties in with, I think what Chris also said, just um, on the use of the CRP, would a history of inflammation or a patient known with inflammation, would that trump the CRP cutoff. I'm just thinking how specific and sensitive is the cutoff of five that you use. And mm -hmm. if you've got a patient with a clear history of, you know, chronic inflammation, can can that kind of can that be enough for you to categorize them as a patient with inflammation, even when their CRP is below five? Thanks, Andrea. Yeah. And thank you also for your feedback, Chris. 
I think that's a very good point. And for our study, when we were doing the background research, there's a fairly wide range in what people call an elevated CRP. So some studies will cut it off at a CRP less than three, others, and most commonly in the literature, use five. Uh, our lab is probably moving soon, but currently says a CRP of greater than 10 would be inflammation. So I think CRP undoubtedly is an imperfect marker of inflammation. And it, it would be lovely to do studies with other markers. And perhaps, as you say, including a physician questionnaire to see how well physicians can actually report to say, you know, this is a well, healthy patient versus this is a patient who is unwell. And I suspect that that would be a very, a very useful marker. Uh, to have just that clinical acumen put to use. For our study, though, we we did assess to see the sort of correlation between CRP and ferritin. And essentially, I think the issue with both markers is they can have such a huge range. And perhaps if we had bigger numbers, we wouldn't have had to treat all CRPs above five the same because uh, yeah, there would naturally be differences between a patient who has a CRP of six and a patient who has a CRP of a hundred. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure if I've answered your question. Sure, too. definitely. No, thank you. There's more trouble. <laughs> right, so there are some comments uh, from the audience. Christian uh, Tutin says, excellent, very useful, thanks. Uh, Bridget Hodgkinson from Rheumatology, thanks, great study, practical and helpful. Uh, take home message and also Wayne Simmons, gastroenterology, uh, Bloemfontein, very helpful. Thank you. Well done on the great work. And then I see Prof. Marius Kutsia, um has a question. Were any of the other older reticulocyte indices of any use in the diagnosis of iron deficiency? Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Kutsia, for that question. So we, we didn't look through all the reticulocyte parameters, but did also assess the RPI, and it had a sort of moderate predictive value that wasn't actually selected on either univariable or yeah, analysis as a predictive marker. And yeah, I suppose uh, the issue with it is that it is reduced irrespective of the cause of your blunt and erythropoiesis, whether it is that there's a lack of store or whether there's a suppression on erythropoiesis. Um, yeah, but we didn't look at the other more novel reticulocyte indices. We just included the reticulocyte hemoglobin. Great. Then um, Dr. Jenny Hull, who's got a lot of experience working in Obstin um up north, has got a hand up. Jenny, over to you. You can just unmute yourself, please. Okay, Jenny, you're still muted. Okay, I'm going to go first to Dr. Charlene Parasna, Head of Hematology at UKZN. Uh, Charlene, yes, please go ahead. And then, um, I've got an, I, I've, I was just trying to understand, and um, David did say something about the, um, the fact that malignancies may have an interpretation. Interestingly, I just clocked a patient today. It's a 36-year-old male uh, referred with uh, what is suspected to be a plasma cell leukemia with an HP of 4.5 and a normal MCV. And interestingly, his iron on, um, on admission at the base hospital was 2.14. Transferrin was 1.39, percentage SATs was 12, with a ferritin of 694. Uh, now, obviously, his bone marrow is infiltrated, and the iron particles, unfortunately, were not optimal for them to do an iron stain. So I was just trying to understand, what did he say about the, the effect that malignancies, what did the confounding factor is? Does this patient then have an iron deficiency? An otherwise well man, he's HIV negative. Hi, Dr. Parsner. Thanks for the interesting Thanks. case example. So I think essentially my my question about the malignancies 
was more sort of theoretical in that just having a particular uh, sort of focus of mostly having hematological malignancy, if that might have a particular effect that might make it not applicable to other uh, conditions. But as for that case, it, obviously with our algorithm, he would have fallen outside the, the range and we would have said he is iron replete. And we did see a lot of patients with very low transfer and saturations who did have adequate iron stores. So based on the transfer and saturation alone, I wouldn't be confident to, to say there is iron deficiency. And obviously, as you say, it is very hard to assess um, bone marrow iron in an infiltrated, yeah, hard or impossible in an infiltrated marrow. Uh, of interest, though, we did have one patient with Burkitt's lymphoma who had an iron, a ferritin of 1,500 who had good quality particles with absent stainable iron. So uh, my feeling in these patients would be that the best approach would be to simply bear in mind the possibility of iron deficiency and retest once the patient has uh, received more treatment. I don't know if you have any other comments, Prof. Lo. No, nothing to add to that, uh, David. I think that is clear. Um... I don't know. So, Thank you. Charlene, do you want? Do you have a follow up question? Maybe. No, no. It, it's just it's so interesting. I'm mm -hmm. so happy with this. Um, David, very well done. It was really, really a nice study. Um, thank you. Thank you. Great. Then we've got Dr. Mike Henry. He's got his hand up. Mike is a GP in Port Elizabeth. Uh, if you're still in Port Elizabeth, Mike, with a, a very um, special interest also in patient blood management and active on our group. Great to see you here. Is it the same, Mike? Yes, Prof. Thanks very much. Uh, just okay. a comment. Just a comment from a GP. So just uh, excuse me for my ignorance. But in, in the case that has just been discussed, <clears throat> could we not say that basically the question is, will this patient benefit from iron? Are they deficient? Do they have enough iron? So I'd like to propose a concept of an iron challenge test where you look at the <coughs> um, reticular site parameters, then you give them an IV iron dose of, say, 200 milligrams, and a couple of days later, you again look at the reticular sites, and you clever hematologists will know what to look at but couldn't you, by looking at the reticular sites over a short period of time, say whether there's a positive response to giving iron or not? And if there was a positive response, you could say in retrospect, huh, this patient was iron deficient. Dr. Henry, that, uh, that's an excellent point. And in fact, something that kept me worried that the reviewers would pick it up and ask about it. So... You you may describe yourself as uh, as being humble, but I think you've hit the nail on the head that reticulocyte hemoglobin has been shown to be a very useful marker in predicting response to iron therapy. And ultimately, that is what we care about, is that we want to be able to identify those who will have an improvement in symptoms and an improvement in HB when treated with iron. So I think, yeah, that would be an excellent consideration uh, to say for those cases that are uncertain. Um, and that would include those who would fall on the iron deficiency side and those who would fall on the iron deficiency unlikely side. In all those cases, the trial could very well be worth, worth it. Thanks very much. Mike, if I can add to that... Um... That's exactly what, what some people propose as almost a, maybe the silver standard, not the gold standard, but is to give a patient a trial of iron therapy when you're a little bit uncertain, but you suspect it, but not 100%. And if they respond, um, that is often an indication. I think your suggestion of using maybe a lower dose of IV iron um, 
is a very good one because it's going to be cost effective and you not going to you're unlikely to overload any patient with a small dose of iron sucrose so i think that's actually a, an idea that i've not thought about before and very very helpful thank you for the suggestion dr ruth Gopi, um i think ruth is now at two military hospital if i remember correctly ruth did a postgraduate diploma in transfusion medicine many years ago with us in bloemfontein and she says excellent informative research well accomplished david and uh, let me just quickly go back to Chris because I think Chris was also unmuted and looked like he had something else to comment and maybe Chris I'll, I'll give you the closing comment um, and uh, then I will just thank our contributors oh, uh, just a thought um, and also a, a comment does the presence of an iron deficiency anemia alter the natural history of an HIV infection apart from increasing symptomatology, does it contribute or alter the natural history? And the reason I ask is in inflammatory bowel disease, iron deficiency obviously contributes to symptomatology, but undiagnosed will impact on the natural history and also in patients who are on treatment. Their response to treatment might not be as good as those that have the iron deficiency corrected. So this is really very important in inflammatory bowel disease to select those patients who are truly iron deficient and replace them parenterally. So this again, this algorithm um, is really something that I think is going, going to help us enormously. So thank you again. Thank you. Wonderful. So thank you, Chris, for that uh, very good uh, final comment. Now, with that, I want to let you know that uh, hopefully David's article will be published soon. It's already... He's already responded to the reviewers' comments. So we'll hopefully have it officially in print in the near future and then uh, share it on the patient blood management WhatsApp group for sure. We'll share the link. Uh, but look out for publication in the journal Pathology. And then um, I would really like to thank you, David, for a very clear and very lucid and eloquent presentation. I enjoyed listening to you can't believe how much I'm still learning about iron, you know, it's amazing. It's just so wonderful. And uh, it was so great to, to, to be involved with this study and work with you during the time that we worked together. A special thanks to the ECHO uh, team in uh, New Mexico, as well as the, the ECHO India team. Um, for those who may have come late or would like to recommend this talk to your friends and colleagues, uh, recordings are made available on the Gastro Foundation website. So please go and have a listen again. If you want to go and uh, look at those cutoffs and that algorithm, it will be there. Thanks very much, Chris and the Gastro Foundation for the fantastic work you're doing. Again, cannot uh, be more positive and excited about what you're doing all over Africa. All those amazing Lancet reviews. It's just great, great, great to see. And... Uh, yeah, thanks to the sponsors. And I want to invite everybody to next week's session, which will be on lower GI endoscopy. I'm sure this that will be um, a very, very good session. And we as hematologists and general practitioners are very thankful to all of you gastroenterologists that look after our patients and help us get to the underlying cause of the iron deficiency, which we're also passionate about to catch those cancers and polyps and ulcers early. So thank you for all you guys are doing. And with that, it's exactly 17.30. Thanks to everybody for your questions, wonderful contributions. What a fantastic session. And we look forward to the next one again. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks so David. Much. Thank you, Vernon. Thank you.